Okay, thank you, Jean. Well, I've called this talk a computational model of reasoning between logic and cognition. Reasoning and rationality, oppositional conceptions. A recurrent theme in this summer school and in many studies on reasoning is the following. Is human reasoning logical? Are logic and cognition opposed? Many psychologists developing algorithmic models of human reasoning and of logical errors tend to say no to the first question and yes to the second. It, what I would call a rather irrationalist standpoint. So human reasoning is quite different from logical reasoning and logic and cognition are distinct things and for certain of them, well, to teach logic, for example, would be useless from the cognitive standpoint. Logicians, on the other hand, hope a yes to the first question. Human reasoning, they at least hope that it is logical and usually do not answer the second question. That, I mean, like, most of logicians, unfortunately, at least the logicians of the the previous generation, for example, the teachers I had, uh, were not very interested in, in the cognitive dimensions of reasoning. Computer scientists usually try to make a compromise between these two opposite conceptions, trying to simulate vi via formal tools some of the results of the psychological studies. So these, the first standpoint and the third standpoint, you have heard much of, about it, during last week and the beginning of this week. My standpoint is different. I will try to oppose the opposition in what I could call a logical contribution to cognition. I would say I'm a, I was first trained as a logician and now I have taken a cognitive turn. Okay, from algorithmic to computational explanations, I use here David Mars 1982 distinction. Spontaneous logical errors have been explained through different algorithmic theories, that is, theories that explain the steps followed by minds in order to proceed information. So this gave, uh, this gave place to theories like mental logic theories, see for example brain, mental models theories, we have discussed much more of uh, mental models theories here than, log than lo uh, mental logic theory. See uh, Johnson Laird and Rudburn who was with us, for example, last week. And you will process these theories that are m very uh, important now. See, for example, uh, 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 Jonathan Evans the, that I read uh, his beautiful paper last week, and Kate Stanovich. Some theories in the recent years have been more than uh, the, than algorithmic and I've been partly algorithmic and partly computational. Uh, for example, I'm thinking of Oxford and Chater or Stanning and Van Lambalgen. We heard for two hours, very interesting by Keith Stan Stanning on the, on the job that they're doing. I use here the expression computational theory, not in the restricted sense of only computer programming, but in a broader sense that includes also the development of formal models of the treatment of information that use reasoners. Okay, our standpoint then will be as follows and you will understand better as my lecture will go on. I, I, I try to develop com a computational theory based on the formal structures behind reasoning and that will help, I hope, to understand the cognitive functions of reasoning our object of studies. Two families of logical errors will be studies, that is fallacies and suppressions of valid inferences. The inferences that will be studied and that are very common in our cognitive activity are structured the following way. There is a major premise that bears a binary connective between two propositions. It affirms, a, for example, a principle, a rule, a law, a norm, a, an hypothesis, a knowledge, etc and a minor premise which affirms or deny as a fact one of the two propositions involved in the major premise. Then a conclusion occurs and it relates the fact of the, first prem of the second premise to the rule of the first premise and then affirms or denies the other proposition in the major premise. The 
most simple example of this is, for example, the modus ponens. Okay, some results in experimental psychology. First, about fallacies, and then I will talk about suppression of valid inferences. Numerous studies in the psychology of reasoning since the Ways and Cards experiment show that laypersons tend to make the following inferences and to consider them valid, be they valid or invalid, and so happen to commit fallacies. We have discussed a lot about that on last Monday and Tuesday with a psychologist. First, there are inferences on conditionals. Uh, just a remark for those who are not used to the terms. Uh, ponendo or ponens come from ponere in Latin, which means to assert, and toleri, which means to deny or to negate. Okay. So we have four modes of the structure that I presented in the, in the previous uh, slide. Four modes on conditionals. The modus ponendo ponens, that is, if P happens, then Q happens, that's the rule, and then P happened, that's the ponendo, and in the conclusion, that's the ponens, then Q will happen. Okay, and it is valid, and people have a tendency to use it frequently. The modus tolendo tollens, what I, that I will call MTT. And you, you see now that I won't talk about MT or MP, but MTT and MPP, and you will see why, because there will be variation with MPT and MTP and so on. Okay, and the modus tolendo tollens is valid if P then Q, and not Q, then not P. If it rains, I, brings my, um, I bring my umbrella. I haven't brought my umbrella, so it doesn't rain. And it's valid, and most people, not as much, not as many as with the MPP, but most people use it and consider it as valid. But they also consider as valid the affirmation of the consequent and the denial of the antecedent. If P, then Q, and Q, then people have a tendency to conclude P and to consider that it's certain, that this conclusion is certain, which is not from a logical standpoint. And the denial of the antecedent, if P, then Q, if it rains, I bring my umbrella, it doesn't rain, so Serge won't bring his umbrella. And people are sure of that. Well, from a logical standpoint, it's not valid, as you know. Also, there is a literature less than on conditionals, but there is certain literature on disjunctions that shows that people have a tendency to accept the four modes as they do for the conditionals. So there is the modus tollendo ponens here. P or Q, and not P, then Q, which is valid, and people use it. P or Q and not Q, then P, it's valid and people use it. But they also tend to systematically consider valid the two invalid for, uh, 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 forms that follow. The MPT, P or Q and, and P, so not Q. P or Q and Q, then not P. And even in some experiments in which you say, well, P could be the case, Q could be the case, or both of them could be the case. And nonetheless, people consider that it's not an or, but an either or. Okay. Valid inferences and invalid inferences. A valid inference, inference from the standpoint of logic is such that when the premises are true, the conclusion is necessarily true. That's the truth preservation condition that uh, Katerina talked about this morning. All the previous inferences on conditionals would be valid on biconditionals or equivalences. The MPP, the MTT, but also the AC and the DA would be valid with equivalences. All the previous inferences on inclusive disjunctions would be valid on exclusive disjunctions. See, for example, the MTP that was valid with an inclusive disjunction, but also the MPT would be valid with exclusive disjunction. P or Q and P, then not Q, would be valid with an exclusive disjunction. Okay. So laypersons, in, in order to summarize, I could say that laypersons tend to interpret conditionals if-then relations as equivalences if and only if, and disjunction or relations as exclusive disjunctions, either P or Q. Why is it so? Well, I will take a formal detour via, via the formal structures behind classical logic. The Boolean lattice, the rules of classical propositional logic, especially the ones that work in the previous examples on conditionals and disjunctions,
are all instantiations of the structure of the Boolean lattice. In order, uh, the Boolean lattice is an order structure such that any node at the left of the diagram logically implies any node at its right that is connected to it by a green arrow. For example, uh, P and Q over here implies P no matter the value of Q, which implies P or Q, which implies a tautology between P and Q. I mean, all the conditionals are valid when you do not go from true on the left to false on the right. The, the conditional is valid in, in all the other situations. When you go to, from true to true, it's valid. From false to true, it's valid. And from, fal from false to false, it's valid also. So these are, I would say, the valid one ways of the logical structure of propositional uh, calculus. And this way, we can say that it's an ordered, an ordered structure and a totally ordered structure. So this is a summary of the valid inferences that you can make in, in uh, classical propositional logic. Each column, column is such that the number of true values in the truth table is constant. The first column that contains only a contradiction between P and Q has four false values. It's a contradiction. This, the second column going from left to right is the column of the situation in which there is one true value and three false values. This is why there are con conjunctions. The third row, you have true true values and true false values. And the, the fourth, you have three true values and one false. And the fifth, you have the tautologies that, are, that have four true values. According to Shannon's law of information, at the left, you have I information. At the right, you have I probability. I mean, when you know that P and Q is true, the, this one here, well, you know much. Only one of four possibilities, according to you, is true. But when you know that P or, true is, uh, uh, P or Q is true, this one here, you know much less, because you know that at least one of the two is true, and maybe both are true. So, in a logical law, you cannot go from true to false. This way, you have to keep a high probability. And the true preservation property of logical laws is such that the probability of a logical law is one. And so the information is zero. That's very important from a cognitive standpoint. OK. The fallacies that I have presented earlier on the disjunctions and on the conditionals, well, they could be considered according to what I have said about the uh, Boolean lattice as invalid uses of the one ways in the Boolean lattice. Treating conditionals as equivalences and disjunctions, inclu inclusive disjunctions, as exclusive disjunctions, lay persons make fallacies, making inferences in the invalid direction, that is from right to left. So they increase unduly the information given by the premises and do not take into account some probability some state of affairs. I mean, they, they consider a connective with three possibilities of being true as a connective with two possibilities of being true, not taking into account the third one, okay? So I have indicated with arrows going to the, in, le uh, in the left direction, red arrow that is from the standpoint of logic, errors, okay. You see that psychologists have made experiments that show this. Other, uh, and of course, they have made m much more experiments that show this, but never work on that. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about this, some of the predictions that this model can make. Predictions on fallacies in reasoning with incompatibilities. Given that layperson make fallacies treating conditionals as equivalences, and inclusive disjunctions as exclusive disjunctions, we can predict that they treat incompatibilities. That is what we call in the classes of logic the Sheffer stroke, created by the logician Sheffer. They consider that Sheffer stroke as exclusive disjunction between negated terms. Instead of considering 
P is incompatible with Q as not P or inclusive Q, uh, or inclusive not Q, they treat it as not P exclusive the junction not Q. Okay, so this is the prediction that my model makes here that logic uh, that psychologists never experienced before what I will uh, be talking about. Predictions on fallacies in reasoning with incompatibilities. Okay, this, what I've said about the Schiffer's trope, this implies that reasoners would tend not only to accept the valid MPT on incompatibilities, but also the fallacious MTP, increasing one again, once again the information beyond what is given in the premises. So people would tend, according to this hypothesis, would tend to make the modus ponendo tollens that is valid, but also the modus tollens opponents that is not valid. P is incompatible with Q, and P happens, then not Q, which is valid. P is incompatible with Q, and Q, then not P, which is valid. P is incompatible with Q, and not P, then Q. P is incompatible with Q, and not Q, then P, which is not valid, because what could happen with the, the incompatibility stroke is that not P happens, or not Q happens, or neither P nor Q happen, which is this third possibility which is excluded. Okay, I will now explain uh, these fallacies not only as going in the wrong direction in the Boolean lattice, but also as crushes of Klein groups. Okay, what is a Klein group? Well, in the Boolean lattice, there are substructures that we call Klein groups. A Klein group is a structure of transformation on connectives. These transformations in Klein groups are functions on the truth values of the connective. They can be defined in terms of variables. Let's take A, B, C, D, and A, B, A, B C, and D represent truth values. Because we're in classical logic in this case, the, truth, the set of truth values is of only T and F, true and false. Okay, the, the identical transformation the, that we can call I, well, the I of ABCD is ABCD. For example, the identical transformation of if P then Q is if P then Q. The inverse transformation of ABCD is not A, not B, not C, not D. For example, if you have uh, P or Q, its truth values is true, 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 false, then the inverse is false, 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 true. That is not P and not Q. Okay, that's the inverse. The reciprocal transformation of ABCD is the same truth values, but after reversing the order, so it's DCBA. So uh, true, uh, if you have truth values that are true, 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 false, the, the reciprocal transformation would give false, true, true, true. Okay, and the dual transformation is the N of R, or the R of N, that is the combination of the two previous transformation that we call the dual transformation. And this way, for example, a disjunction and a conjunction are two duals. That is, the truth, when you have the truth values A, B, C, D, the truth value of the dual is not D, not C, not B, not A. Okay, why do you say that? Well, because Within classical logic, you can say that there are Klein groups within the Boolean lattice. So, uh, there are Klein groups with two propositional atoms as P and Q that give Klein groups. First, I, there are what I call crushed Klein groups because they're simplified groups in which there are only two pairs of identical transformation. A tautology and a contradiction are such that I and R are the same, N and D are the same. These two are very important, you will see why. The equivalence between P and Q and the exclusive disjunction between P and Q are also of this kind. There are crush kind, Klein groups, we could say vertical crushes of Klein groups. That is the top crushes on the bottom. And this way I equals R and N equals D. There are other kinds, uh, I mean, no, they're, they're horizontal, uh, sorry, horizontal crushes. I equals R and N equals D. These are vertical crushes because, 
the va p, no matter what happens to q or not q, no, no matter what happens to, to p, uh, uh, not p, not, no matter what happens to q, or q, no matter what happens to p, and not q, no matter what happens to p, they're such that their vertical crushes i equals d and r equals n. Okay. But there are two authentic, genuine Klein groups in which i, n, r, and d are distinct transformations. You have it with the conditionals. If P then Q, this is the hem of if P then Q. This, the only situation in which if P then Q is false, that is when you have P and not Q. This is the, the heart of if P then Q, if Q then P, which is the reciprocal conditional. And this is the M of if Q then P here. And it's the dual of this, okay. And you have the same on the other side with the disjunction and the un incompatibility. So disjunction and incompatibilities form genuine, let's say, rectangular Klein groups. And the conditionals do the same. Geo this is a geometrical representation of the transformations within the Klein group that are such that to make a high transformation, it's to stay at the same place. To make a hand transformation, it's to follow the, a diagonal. To make a hard transformation, it's to shift horizontally. And to make a D transformation, it's to shift vertically. Why do I talk about these things? It is because all the fallacies that spontaneous reasoners tend to make are such that they do not take into account the dual of the disjunction, that is a conjunction, the dual of this one, the incompatibility that is this one, and the dual of the implications that are these ones. Okay, so let's move on a little. The fallacies as crushings of Klein groups. All the fallacies that we have presented earlier have a common structural feature from the perspective of the Klein group. They all can be explained as not to take into account the duals of the connectives. That is, the dual not P and Q for if P then Q, the dual P and not Q for Q if Q then P, when we consider the conditionals as equivalences and make the fallacy of the AC and DA, affirmation of the consequence and denial of the antecedent. And the, people do not take into account the dual P and Q for P or Q and consider P or Q as an exclusive disjunction instead of inclusive when we consider exclusive disjunction as exclusive disjunction. Not to take into account these duals is equivalent to an horizontal crushing of the genuine Klein group as if they were the group between the equivalence between P and Q and the exclusive disjunction between P and Q in which R equals R and N equals D from a computational standpoint. So, the fallacies on conditionals are this crush, and the fallacy on this junction or incompatibilities are this crush. Okay, very good. And you see that this way I can predict things that psychologists have not studied up to now. That is the fallacy, the fallacies with the use of the Sheffer stroke here. So this this is the same Boolean lattice but that has been rotated counterclockwise of 90 degrees. You see, instead of being like this, it's like this. And then you see the crushing in the, the group of the conditionals and in the larger group of the, just larger just because of this position on the, the screen, uh, the larger group of the disjunctions and the incompatibilities. Okay. Experiments on incompatibilities made by my assistant, Jenny Brisson, which is right here. Our hypothesis, the more a premise, a premise with incompatibility permits the generation of an instance of the dual, the one that people forget, not P and not Q, as a, that is a counterexample, the less people will accept the invalid inference. She made experiments and it was uh, conclusively positive. So, in, and she did it in the lab of Henri Markovitz, my colleague here in psychology who lectured last week. So thanks to Jenny, thanks to Henri and their team. It, in easy inferences, for example, being a broccoli is incompatible with being a pepper. This vegetable is a broccoli. It is not a broccoli. 
then people have a tendency to say, then it's, it's a pepper and it's an, it's an error because it could be a carrot or anything else. The mean acceptance rate is 19.9% of the invalid inference. Medium inference, medium level of difficulty. We're in Montreal and people don't know well the geography of Germany. Being in Berlin is incompatible with being in, in Hamburg. I'm not in Berlin, so I should be in Hamburg. And the rate of acceptance is a little higher. Difficult inferences. Betting heads is incompatible with betting tails. The mean acceptance rate is 64.2%. People, when you say, well, I did not, this person did not bet on heads, then most people would say then the person has bet on tails. But people could bet on the, P, the coin will fall on the edge, for example. Yeah. Okay. All of these results were present, that are, were presented are statistically significant, and it will be published soon. Okay, I have discussed about fallacies, two problems with fallacies that human reasoners do. They, go, they make infractions in the one ways of the uh, Boolean lattice, and this is equivalent to crush horizontally declined groups. Okay. Now, suppression of valid inferences. Many studies in the psychology of reasoning since Byrne 1989, Ruth was with, with us last week, and I talked about this situation when I introduced uh, Keith Stenning. Uh, these experiments show that people tend to suppress valid inferences on conditionals in certain conditions. For, for example, see a modus ponens opponents. You say to the participants, if Mary has a textbook to read, she will study late in the library. She has a textbook to read, so most people will say, therefore, she will study late in the library. Okay, then you say, you, new problem. If the library is open, Mary will study late in the library. And the library is open, so therefore, people will conclude correctly, she will study late in the library. Then you come back to the first problem. If Mary has a textbook to read, she will study late in the library. She has a textbook to read, so, and people won't conclude. Therefore, well, it's depending on the schedule of the library. So they will consider the, the schedule of the library as a possible disabler of the modus ponens. Okay, okay. what happens in the form, uh, if you, we try to formalize the suppression of valid inferences? You see, that's exactly the opposite situation compared to the previous. In fallacies, people draw a conclusion and they think it is certain while it is not from a logical standpoint. In the suppression of valid inferences, they, they do the opposite. They could conclude logically with a certain conclusion and they avoid to do that. So with a modus ponens, we have the situation if P then Q and P, so Q, but people consider it as if P and R, that is the library is open, then Q and P happens because they don't know if Q or not Q happens, they will they will not conclude. We don't know about the, this, this R, and this way we don't know about Q. Suppression of the valid modus tollens, the, the same occurs, but I can skip this one. It's exactly the same structure. Okay. Predictions of suppression on disjunction and incompatibilities, but because what happened? Psychologists have made experiments on fallacies with conditionals and disjunctions, not on incompatibilities. They have made experiments on suppression of valid inferences with conditionals, but not with my two other connective, the disjunction and the incompatibility. So our hypothesis, that has to be tested and we will surely do that. The suppression of valid inferences with disjunction and incompatibilities could happen as it is for conditional. So the suppression with disjunctions would, would go as follow. The valid MTP on disjunction would not be made. P or Q and not P then Q, but it will be considered as P or Q or R and not P. And so people are not sure if they could conclude Q. For example, uh, I go to the pet shop and they sell uh, dogs and canaries. Uh, okay, uh, dogs and canaries. I don't buy a dog, I buy something, I don't buy a dog, so I will buy a canary. But meanwhile, maybe the owner of the pet shop has, has bought cats and, sell, and, and sells cats. So this way I will make a suppression of the MTP because I could also buy a cat. 
Same thing with the suppression of the MTP that is valid on the incompatibility. So here you see that you made a suppression here when you discover a new category outside the ones that you had earlier. Here you, you make a suppression when you discover a, a new category, but not outside the ones that you already manage, but in between the ones that you already manage. For example, people, you say to people, P is incompatible with Q and P then not Q. I'm, lo I'm in love with, uh, with a woman is incompatible of being in love with a lion, with a she lion. I'm in love with a woman, then I'm not in love with a she lion. But if the woman I love, I consider it metaphorically maybe as something that has some properties of the she lion, of a, of a mother lion, then I would say, well, P is incompatible with Q or R, or she is in between, and she is P then can I conclude not Q? Maybe not. So people will avoid from, make, from making the inference. Okay, how can we represent in the Boolean lattice the suppression of valid inferences? Well, they will be stretching of the Boolean lattice. There is the Boolean lattice in green and black, and I have added this. Well, P or Q will be considered as P or Q or R, the cats that are, that are not available at a pet shop. P and Q implies P will be considered as Q and R. Make sure that the library is open before you conclude, implies P. Same thing for the other, if P then Q, P and R implies Q, and P isn't compatible with Q, I cannot love at the same time a woman and a, and, and a she lion. Well, the one I love might be at, at the same time both. So instead of interpreting P incompatible with Q, I will interpret this as P incompatible with Q or R, which is something in between P and Q. Okay, so suppressions are increases in the possibilities, in the prob probabilities and decreases of information. In the fallacy, you put too much information in the premise, okay, in the premises. In the suppression of valid inferences, because you have new information, you diminish the amount of information that was presented in the premises. There is a logical possibility, a probability, that was not taken into account in the original formulation of the inference. From the standpoint of Klein groups, suppressions of valid inferences could be considered as bursts of the Klein group. So that's why I rep represented my two genuine Klein groups with openings at each corner, because when you have a suppression of the inference, you have P or Q or R. So maybe R happens or does not happen, so it opens two possibilities at this corner. Same thing at each corner. Two possibilities are open in the suppression of inferences. So in the suppression of valid inferences, each corner of each genuine Klein group is open with two possibilities. Okay. Modeling other logical contexts of reasoning. So you see, this is a standpoint different from the ones we had up to now in this, in this meeting. We had um, experimental studies by psychologists. We had computer modeling of human reasoning by logicians or computer scientists or let's say people with formation in formal sciences. And now this is, I'm the logician who tries to establish a link that is to use logical tools to explain what happens at the cognitive level. Our computational approach can also be used for the analysis of fallacies and of suppression of valid inferences in logics other than the classical propositional logic. That's, and this is why I was particularly excited by the studies presented by Christine Searett last week, the, the studies she does with children, that suggest that the problems I'm talking about are things that happened in the mind of children with other types of reasoning. For example, in predicate logic, it's logically valid that if all x are, high, are a, then some, x, some x's are a. But when people will tell you, well, are you talking about all or some? And if you want to talk about some, just say some are his. Don't say, all are uh, and if you want to talk about all, we'll say all are haze. But don't say if all are haze, then some are haze. Same with the modal logic. Necessary P 
implies possibly be. If you want to say necessary, just say necessary. Don't say necessary is true and possibly will also be true. And if it's only possibly true, say only possibly. That's the way spontaneous reasoners think, but this is totally valid. Same thing with, for example, temporal logic. This connective here, in all futures, P is true. And this is, there is at least one future in which P is true. And this is totally valid. If, all, if P is true in all futures, then it implies logically that it's true in at least one future. Okay, it's a law, but people would, spontaneous reasoners would disagree about that. And all those fallacies that I'm talking about are such that in classes of logic, there are many students who look at me and say, hey, is this serious? Is, is this the way logic works? Yes, it is the way logic works. Okay, some consequences of our work. Some scientific consequences of our work. Well, you have seen it with the fallacies on incompatibilities and the suppression of valid inferences with disjunctions and incompatibilities. It predicts treatments of information that human minds might do and that has not been yet identified and studied by the psychologist of reasoning. See, for example, what I've said, the fallacies with incompatibilities and the suppressions with disjunctions and incompatibilities. Also, we can deduce the function, some of the functions of logic and cognition and other types of inferences in cognition. See what I will do in the next slides. There are also, there are also important pedagogical consequences to our work for the improvement of, of the teaching of logic. I really enjoyed this morning what Katarina said about the strategies the concerning dialogues and things like that. But there are other strategies that I can deduce from what, uh, the analysis that I make. A first step that it would be relevant in the course of logic is an awareness of possible counterexamples to the conclusions in order to avoid the fallacies and the awareness of relying on just the information given in the premises in order to avoid the suppressions. So because students will spontaneously try, have a tendency to make fallacies, just say, make sure that you don't have any counterexamples to the conclusion that you draw. You might do a fallacy. On the other hand, st stick to the premises. Stick to your guns. <laughs> I mean, if the premise says, I buy a cat or a canary. Don't, don't tell me, well, I heard that the, 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 the person that owns the, the pet shop has now cats. No, no, no. Stick to the premises. Otherwise, you can't learn logic. Okay. This, though, so the second step, after this first step that is more empirical, we go a little more theoretical and explain to the students that they make the fallacies when they forget to take into account the duals of the, of the, the, the disjunctions and compatibilities and the conditionals. So be aware of the duals. And a third step, well, in more advanced class, that would be a formal study of the underlying structures of logical system. For example, explain to the students in a more advanced course, what is a Klein group, what is a Boolean lattice, and when you make a fallacy, you crush the Klein group, you go in the wrong direction in the one ways of the lattice, and you, you burst the, the Klein groups when you make a suppression of inference, and you stretch the Boolean lattice when you make such a suppression. These steps can also be implemented in an intelligent tutoring system, and this is what Rajin Kambu, which is here, uh, I and our assistant are working on, and we'll have a lecture on that on Friday afternoon. Okay, cognition, monotonic, and non-monotonic inferences. Reasoning is a set of cognitive procedures in the mind. Okay, it makes us, spon spon uh, it, make it makes us, spontaneous, uh, uh, rely spontaneously on non-monotonic procedures. That is the one at work in the fallacies and in the suppressions of valid inferences. So people make fallacies and invalid uh, uh, and suppressions of valid inferences because they tend to re reason in a non-monotonic way. We have a nat natural tendency to make the, the fallacies which implies to consider 
only one cause for each effect in the conditionals. And in categorization, we consider it as being dichotomous. I mean, cats or dog, good or bad, true or false. But I mean, a third possibility outside these ones or within these ones, for example, in a metaphor, are things that people do not tend to take into consideration. Okay, logic, that is avoiding the fallacies, but I would say also avoiding the suppression of the valid inferences. Logic avoiding the fallacies is cognitively relevant. Why is it relevant to avoid the fallacies? Because it helps us to discover the possibilities of alternative causes in conditionals and of hierarchical categorization and disjunctions and incompatibilities. And this is a very important point to me. So many people in cognitive science have a tendency to oppose logical reasoning and human cognitive, cognitively relevant reasoning. Well, this here shows that to learn logic helps us from a cognitive standpoint. It helps us to avoid not to, to, to take into account the duals. And for example, when I say if P then Q, and Q is the case, well, you will more easily not conclude P, and you will more easily not make the fallacy if you can consider that P could cause Q, but something else also could cause Q. For example, if it rains, I bring my umbrella, I have brought my umbrella, so people will spontaneously say, then it rains. Well, Serge could have taken it just to show it to Jenny because she told me, could you bring it tomorrow and I want to buy someone like, like yours and I want to see it, which is totally possible from a cognitive standpoint. Okay. The same with categorization. If people have a simple tendency to categorize dichotomously, true, false, good, bad, etc., and it's more economical this way, but it's make them make fallacies with the disjunctions and the incompatibilities because they do not take into account the dual situation. The situation in which P and Q are both true in the disjunction and the dis situation in which neither P nor, true, uh, nor Q is true in the incompatibility. Suppressions of valid inferences are procedures for the discovery of alternative effects of causes. If she has a textbook to read, she will study late in the library. But if the library is open, okay. But if it's closed, no, it won't work. So it, it makes the causal chain longer. Instead of having the, the textbook to read and the, st the studying in the library, there are three components in the causal chain. The, the text to read, the schedule of the library, and then the, the presence of Mary in the library. So suppression of valid inferences are procedures for the discovery of alternative effects of causes and for the discovery of new categories in disjunction and incompatibilities. So learning depends at times on avoiding fallacies via logic or avoiding logic via the suppression of valid inferences, which is very interesting, I would say. Logic and communication. Reasoning is also not only a way a tool for, for knowing, but it's also a set of procedure of communication and social interactions. We reason a lot, not only through our cognitive activity, but to, through our social activities. Logical inferences make explicit the necessarily true con con conclusion of the information present in the premises. This way, they are monotonic. In human communication, logical inferences are so not relevant as Keith Stenning told me last week, it was very exciting when I told, he told me that. They would be boring. I mean, if you take the class, the course of logic, and you consider that it's an interesting story that the, the teacher will tell you, well, Serge is, to like any professor of logic, he's totally boring as a storyteller in the, in the course, because all what he says is unnecessarily true evidences of the premises that are in the problems. But non-monotonic reasoning is relevant in human communication. To learn logic is to learn to use monotonic reasoning to obtain deductive certainties and this makes us a little less social. You go to a course of logic, you make a doctorate in, in logic, then you will be a person having a tendency to explicit all the true consequences of the information that 
you have attend. And this way, you might be a little less social than others, a little more Sheldon Cooper than <laughs> most people. Okay, logic, my wife tells me at times that I'm a kind of Sheldon Cooper. Logic, cognition, and social life. Human beings are cognitive and social animals. We're both at the same time. The spontaneous reasoning that makes us commit fallacies helps us to be so social. See the social functions of implicatures. For example, if I would say, uh, you know, uh, all A's are C's. And you know why this is so? Well, it is because all A's are B's and all B's are, C are C's. For example, instead of saying, well, all cats are animals, I would say, well, given that all cats are mammals and that all mammals are animals, then all cats are animals. And the, the, the person would say, well, Serge, get to the point a little faster if you could. Okay. The suppression of inferences helps us to be cognitively efficient, to make a revision of the premises given new information. That is the basis of the definition of what is non-monotonicity. Okay, so logics helps us to make, our, to make our cognition and our social life systematic. For example, a question that could be asked, why in the evolution have we invented logic? Well, it's because at times we need to make them more explicit all the, con the possible conclusions of the premises to make sure that there's no ambiguity between us. For example, in the, in the court, in the, in the court, for example, so the law has to be very logic. Science, a most, a mo and a very important part of, logic, uh, of science is logic. Morality, I mean, in morality, when you do something, you have to justify what you do in front of others while you use logical reasoning to, to justify why you vote Democrat or, or Republican. Okay. Uh, okay, very good. I can summarize now. I'm, I'm close to the end of my talk. The types of inferences, so I, would, I have talked about three types. The ones in which you make fallacies, the ones in which you resp and make you respect classical propositional logic inferential rules, and the ones in, in which you make suppression of valid inferences. In a fallacy, you, you consider a conclusion certain while it is not. In a suppression of valid inference, you could, you could draw a valid conclusion, but you don't, and in between, you do what logic requires. Okay. From the standpoint of the Boolean lattice, the fallacy is an infraction to the one-way rules of the Boolean lattice. The respect of the laws of logic is the respect of the one-way structure of the Boolean lattice. The suppression from the Boolean lattice standpoint is a stretching of the lattice. And from the standpoint of the substructures of the Boolean lattice, that's the decline groups, the fallacy corresponds to a crush. The respect corres corresponds to a classical logic laws is a respect of the group structure, of the Klein group structure more, more specifically, and the suppression is a burst of the group structure with the four corners that collapse. Okay. Now, from the cognitive and social functions of reasoning, well, a fallacy from the cognitive standpoint is to take cognition shortcuts or from a sen in science to make hypotheses. Okay. And res to respect the laws of logic is to learn, it helps us to learn about causes and different causes for the same effect. It helps us to become more rigorous and more scientific this way. And the suppression of valid inferences now helps us to learn about the effects. Okay, from the standpoint of the social functions, well, the fallacies help us to tell and listen to stories, to be good social person that is good to be good storytellers and good story listeners, and to apply correctly the social conventions. Okay, to respect the laws of logic, well, it helps, it helps us not to be good storytellers, to be good proof tellers and to be good justification tellers. We tell stories mo most of the time when we interact with other people. But at times we have to justify our actions, our decisions, and our, our beliefs. And we have, at times, for example, in science, to prove things. This is the way logic could be helpful. And the, and the suppression of valid inferences from a social standpoint, it, we could say that the suppression of valid inferences is good in teaching and learning and learning and communication. What happens in a class of science, not a class of logic of ma or mathematics, but a class of science, well, you 
explain situations that are not the ones we were expecting and this way you students learn from the teacher through the suppression of valid inferences. Conclusions, multiple rationalities. The question was, is logic, uh, uh, is reasoning and rationality and is logic r rational and is rationality only logic? Well, contrary to the standpoint of a strong rationalist, the logician would say there's only one rationality, the one of logic. Or of the ir irrationalist, the one who would say, no, the, ra the, the rationality of the logician has nothing to do with human beings. There are at least three types of rationalities at work in human reasoning. The int what I would call the intuitive rationality, the one at work when we happen to make the fallacies, the one of storytelling. It is rational because it is economical and often cognitively relevant when, for example, an effect has only one cause or when categories are dichotomous. It happens that ca categories are dichotomous. For example, if I say, uh, if you're unmarried, then you're a bachelor. You're a bachelor. Aff affirmation of consequence. It's lo logically invalid to say, uh, then you're unmarried, but it's totally relevant. Okay. The logical or systematic rationality, the one of logical reasoning, the one of proof telling, it structures explicitly the information that we have, it allows the discovery of possibilities of various causes and conditionals and of hierarchical categorizations instead of too simple dichotomous categorization. And the adaptive or suppressive rationality, the one of the cognitive corrections that we make in the suppression of valid inferences, the one of learning as adaptation. Last uh, slide, reasoning and dual processes. Fallacies can be S1 in the shortcuts or S2 in the formulations of scientific hypotheses. Logical reasoning can be S1, for example, in simple MPP reasonings, or S2 in the application of complex valid rules, the ones we learn in advanced classes. Suppressions, the same, can be S1 in spontaneous suppression or S2 in argumentative suppression. So I would say, I would hold that the distinction between S1 and S2 system, the dual processes theory, is relevant, but mainly as a distinction between intuitive unconscious procedures of reasoning versus reflective conscious procedures of reasoning. And my standpoint is that there are S1 and S2 processes in each of the three types of reasoning. The one with fallacies, the one that is perfectly logical, and the one with the suppressions. And I would say also that the inferential history of, man of mankind is a part of its cognitive history. Lo and so, we, uh, through the history, we've been cognitive animals. Inference is an emergence within this, ki this cognitive history. And logic is an emergence in the inferential history within the cognitive history. So lo logic is a specialized emergence in the inferential history. Logic is not all inference, but it is, it is nonetheless an important part of it. Thanks to my assistant, Jenny. Our, refer uh, our last reference, it's uh, in the, uh, volume 10 of June 2016, the Klein group, squares of opposition, because Klein groups are squares of opposition, and the explanation of fallacies in reasoning, which is published in Log Logica Universalis. Thanks to you for your attention.